Welcome to the Soulful CXO, where we discuss leadership principles, core values, health, wellness, and resiliency. I'm Dr. Rebecca Wynn, the founder and the host of the show. Do you have a topic or guest you would like to be featured on the show? Would you like to be a sponsor? Please reach out to me on LinkedIn or email me at Rebecca at SoulfulCXO.com. Please go to our partner, Cybersecurity Tribe, for weekly show recaps and other resources. Listen and subscribe on your favorite podcast app. Now sit back and enjoy the show. Welcome to the Soulful CXO. I'm your host, Dr. Rebecca Wynn. We are pleased to have with us today, Margaret Malloy. Margaret is Global CMO at Seagull Gale, the global brand experience firm behind Simple and Smart Ethos. Since 1969, the company has championed simplicity for leading corporations, nonprofits, and government organizations worldwide. Part of the Omnium Group, clients include CVS Health, HPE, U.S. Army, Bristol Myers, KPMG, The Y, and more. A native of Ireland, Margaret is the founder of Reclaim Wearing Irish, a passion project to tell the untold story of Irish fashion design. She is described by the Irish Times as the unofficial ambassador of Ireland. She has been honored by many Irish organizations, including Douglas Hyde Foundation, Irish Voice Women of Influence, and Top 100 Irish Americans in Business in the U.S. Her strength as a leader, connector, moderator have made her highly influential CMO. Since the COVID lockdown, she has hosted 250 plus leading CMOs, panelists, and thousands of guests from across the globe in the Single Gale Live Future of Branding series. The recordings are all available on the podcast, How CMOs Commit. She's a fierce advocate of DEI and leads award-winning Women's Day, LGBT plus Pride, Gen Z, and Boomer programs. In 2023, her team achieved a top three award for Campaign U.S. Corporate Communications Marketing Team of the Year. She was honored as LinkedIn's top voice in marketing in 2022, the Drum B2B Marketer of the Year, and a Marketing Society Fellow. She has been published in Thought Leader and HBR, Fast Company, Forbes, and more. She is consistently recognized as one of the top CMOs on Twitter and a sought after panel host and podcast guest. Margaret, my friend, welcome to the show. Hello, Rebecca. Thank you very much. And oh my gosh, lesson to self. Need to shorten that bio. <laughs> Thank you for <laughs> indulging it. <laughs> Your background is, is very interesting. So please go ahead and explain to our audience how you were Ireland and you do all the stuff in Ireland. And then you came over here to be the US and you're a powerhouse in the US and you manage both. What does that journey look like to get you to be the great CMO that you are today? Thank you, Rebecca. So I was born and raised in Ireland, went to college there. The eldest of six children grew up in the middle of the country on a farm, dairy farm. And after college, came straight to the United States and have been here ever since. Worked in various companies, always in a marketing role, did my graduate work here at the Harvard Business School. And today I am and have been for the last decade, the global CMO of Siegel and Gale. As you mentioned, Rebecca, our agency is a brand strategy, design, and experience firm, and we have the privilege of helping CMOs build some of the greatest brands in the world, and you kindly mentioned a number of those in the introduction. I know when you and I had talked a little earlier, we also talked about how important it is to have personal brand, and we hear people say that generically. Can you explain us really what is it as a personal brand? How do you acquire it? Do you go buy it? What is that all about? And why is it that important anymore? Yeah, it's a fascinating question, Rebecca. I think I begin with what's a brand? And I'll tell you a little story because I know you love stories. And I grew up, as I mentioned, in Ireland. And my father often would tell us the story of his school, school children days and his days as a schoolboy. And he often mentioned the headmaster in his local school, a gentleman by the name of Mr. Cox. And I recall the story where he said Mr. Cox would admonish the children for writing on their desks graffiti. And he would say to them, you will be remembered not by the writing on your desk, but by your deeds. 
Now, as a child, that was an interesting story. And at the surface level, the message was don't go writing graffiti on your school desk. But when you step back from it, and now with many years of perspective, I realized that that little story explained what a brand really is. A brand is a promise kept. And your personal brand is the promise you are making to your stakeholders and how you keep that promise. Now, whether you intentionally manage your brand or not, we all have one. And our brand is, I would say, the summation. You're a scientist, so so I'll, I'll bring it into mathematical terms. It's the summation of every interaction people have with us and the story we put out about ourselves. And the story can reside in bios, in LinkedIn, in social media platforms, et cetera. So a great brand is one where that story is distinct, the story is authentic, and it's congruent with the experiences people have with you. And those same qualities arguably are the same qualities of any brand, just insert personal brand. Now, I know from my conversations with many people, people have some discomfort with the notion of personal brand. It almost feels too commercial and too contrived. And I say to them, think about it, if it gives you more comfort, as your reputation. In the same way we would ask, what does a company stand for? What does a product stand for? Well, what do you stand for? And how is that brought to life when others experience you? And one of the ways to go about it is to collect data, ask people what three words come to mind when they think of you. Another way is to just reflect to your heart and soul, as you do so beautifully on your podcast, what do you stand for? What is the experience you want others to have with you? And it has to be authentic. Ideally, it's somewhat differentiated. It sets you apart from experiences they have with other people. And it's something you can live every day. And like many brands, certainly I think of my own, as there's a little bit of an aspirational quality to it as well. It's not something you successfully do perhaps every day, but it is what we call in branding that North Star, what you strive for. Uh, it's always interesting because you don't always think about you think about who you work for. And one of the things you don't always think about what you stand for. And that's why I think that there is the great I call reflection anymore about am I really lining with this company or is the company I thought I was lining with making me feel like an imposter and unauthentic of myself? So how do you work with individuals to think more like your own CEO, your own business? to figure out what your personal vision, mission, strategy is? Well, at Siegel & Gale, our expertise is in building corporate brands. So my colleagues comprise strategists, designers, namers, researchers, and all of those professionals work with a fact base from a company. If you think about the Venn diagram, they also work in the context in which the company operates and collect data for the many stakeholders a company can serve, employees, customers, regulators, investors, the community, and also, of course, look at the competitive landscape. And all of those pieces of data help inform the strategy, which is to speak to what is the essence of that corporate or that brand. So that's what we do day in and day out, my colleagues do for brands. We don't do personal branding per se, but some of those inputs, I believe, can be very similar. It's at the essence, what do you stand for? Sometimes it can manifest in articulating a statement. What is your brand? What do you stand for? I think of it in terms of sort of the what, the how, and the why. So what is what you do? How can be the values? how you do it. At Siegel and Gale, our values, for example, are smart, nice, unstoppable, and inclusive. So that's how our stakeholders experience us. And then the why is the purpose. Why do you exist in the world? At Siegel and Gale, our purpose is to make it simpler for others to do business with us and for each other to be successful. 
So that articulation, Rebecca, in the context of Siegel and Gale, you can imagine how someone would take those parameters, the what, the how, the why, and start to apply it to themselves. It begins with self-reflection. And settings like this show are fabulous because you give people the opportunity to reflect on their journeys. And your listeners can take that perhaps as inspiration to reflect on theirs, to look at what the world needs from them, how they can make a difference personally and professionally. I would make a small sidebar um, because I'm aware that some people find personal branding Uh, distasteful or they don't like it as a concept. I would say it's useful for everyone to do that reflection and then to articulate their brand and put that story out in public platforms like LinkedIn. But it's particularly important for minority groups for whom stereotypes might be pervasive, whether it's stereotypes about women, stereotypes about um people of color, any population. So you want to tell your story so stereotypes don't consume the oxygen in the air when someone's talking about you. The other point that may be worth noting, you mentioned my global context, is the appetite for personal branding or managing one's reputation can vary quite a bit culturally. So in the United States, for example, many people are very comfortable articulating what they stand for and making it very pointed. In other cultures, that might be frowned upon, or frankly, it mightn't be so interesting. So there is an awareness of cultural difference there. I know, for example, when I, on a pro bono basis, worked with some wonderful fashion designers, another little story, and I invited a number of them to come out to New York And we had this wonderful panel conversation and I had the privilege of hosting it and asking questions of the designers about their inspiration, their creations, et cetera. And at one point I had to stop the conversation, Rebecca, because the designer was being way too modest and way too humble in telling her story. And I said, hopefully in the nicest possible way, I said, we're in New York you can brag a little bit. <laughs> and the audience, of course, found that to be very funny, an audience full of New Yorkers. But the that individual had to be reminded. And then she went on to tell her story with more gusto and more confidence. But it was the same story. She was still being her authentic self. She just needed to be reminded in the context of New York, where you might have to be a little more humble in telling your story in Ireland, go for it. You own your narrative, tell the story and tell it with pride. Now, today, I would say there's two brands and obviously you're the expert in here, but there's the external brand that showing to clients. And then what we're hearing a lot through Glassdoor or Indeed or people changing jobs, the internal brand and what people go ahead and that they're seeing that you're you're telling your, your day-to-day staff. You mentioned about DEI and being inclusive. And that's even talking about education and like where, how do you, you guys manage companies to help them where it's the internal brand that affects who you can hire and who wants to come work for you as well as external, which is a little different on who might want to buy your services. Rebecca, it's such an excellent point. And we have a team of colleagues who engage in that discipline. At the highest level, it's known as employer branding or what's the employee brand. And we have colleagues who help companies articulate a compelling value proposition to future and present employees. And it answers questions like, what is our purpose? Why come to work here? And it's deeper than articulating in a job description, for example, what are the benefits? Because very often it's very hard to differentiate on benefits. Benefits literally being the perks, the salary, the various aspects of compensation, the holidays, et cetera. But increasingly as Gen Z and in fact, other generations too, think about how they spend their time. Part of that is influenced by What's the purpose a company has in the world? What's the difference I am making? So employer branding is a big discipline and a growing discipline. And often where we have found that to be 
happening at companies is when the head of HR and the head of marketing are collaborating because it intersects with those two disciplines. The beginning of interest in this discipline, if I think back on it, was probably in recent times when we had, particularly in the tech community, a very tight labor market. And tech companies were trying to attract engineering talent or any aspect of scarce talent. And there's a limit to how many stock options you can offer. Or at some point, other companies were finding it difficult to compete with the tech companies because they had stock options and other methods of compensation that weren't available to non-tech companies. So that has forced companies to come to organizations like ours to try to articulate what is the employee brand And also a corollary of this, Rebecca, what is the employee experience? So at the beginning of the conversation, I talked about a brand is how your stakeholders experience you, be it a personal brand, a corporate brand. Well, the same with the employee brand and thinking about the entire employee journey from recruitment through to living their day jobs, doing their work, even exiting the company. What is that experience like? And we work with companies to articulate that. I will give a little bit of a spoiler alert. We recently published a study called Simplicity at Work. Really fascinating data on how, in fact, only one in four employees find their workplaces to be simple. And simple means easy to get their jobs done and engage with colleagues. So there's lots of opportunity to simplify the customer experience, but also the employee experience, and that unlocks tremendous value for employers. You're well known because you brought up the chaotic life about, especially when running two different companies, that's just like being CMO and then running another company and trying to use technology to make your life as unchaotic as possible. Can you share some of that wisdom on what you've learned and that we might be able to put into practice as individuals or as a corporate perspective on how to use technology to try and give you more balance, more resilience in your life, better quality of life? Yes, I think there are two popular ways I do that. One is LinkedIn. And that answers the question of how do you scale for me? So at Siegel and Gale, we put out quite a bit of thought leadership. And I use LinkedIn as a platform to amplify that. I also use it as a platform to amplify my colleagues and what they are doing. It's also a wonderful way, you know this so well, to connect with people um, from the business development side of my job, but also from the generosity of spirit side, liking others' content, commenting on other people's Uh, products, services, and points of view. So it's a great way to scale our values, the smart, nice, unstoppable, and inclusive. And everyone knows it. I don't think everyone does it particularly well. So there may be more opportunity there. Second tool I use is, unsurprisingly to you, I am an avid podcast listener. I find it a wonderful way to multitask. In general, I'm quite opposed to multitasking. I like focus, but when I'm out walking, I listen to podcasts like yours. It's a great way to get smart fast or even just to broaden your mind on other topics. So those are two very, very simple technologies that I think can be helpful to enhance productivity and reduce chaos and at the same time experience some learning and bring your own personal brand to life. Another thing that you do is you bring other people into the room who might have a different perspective or might have for you to go ahead and stream things um, quicker. I've seen that firsthand when we were going ahead and raging the podcast that you went ahead and you brought other people in the room to make sure that scheduling could work okay, things along those lines. And then at no point in time can a communication break down, which I was like, that's pretty smart. Why don't you do that? Go ahead and you might say 15 minutes for each of their time, but ends up saving long term all of our time. And as you brought in LinkedIn, that's how I met you. I actually was watching your posts, seeing you on LinkedIn, because we both have a big feed, looking to see what you wrote about, what was on your heart. And then I reached out to you on LinkedIn about doing the show and things along those lines, and we arranged it. So I agree with you. There, It's a great way to find if people have a like-minded heart. And even if they don't have like-minded heart, it gives you an opportunity to go ahead and look at that new point of view and see what you might agree with. 
and what you might don't agree with. I still don't think you should be a hater on LinkedIn. I think you should go ahead and use it to learn along those lines. I agree. And two points I would make. One I would say is social media, LinkedIn in particular, is a contact sport. So you cannot delegate that to a junior colleague or to the social media department or the communications department, because then you lose back to the personal brand. You lose the authenticity uh, or you become highly generic. Second thing I would say is you're absolutely right. There is a huge risk that we all live in these echo chambers and we are only influenced by people who share our views and our values. LinkedIn is just a great way. But the trick is make sure your network is diverse, because if everyone looks like you, has the same lived experience, profession, et cetera, then you won't get those views. So those would be two points I'd make. And I suppose the why I bring that perspective is back to our values at Siegel and Gale and our value proposition back to the why did you include other people in the call? Because my intention, uh, Rebecca, was to make it easy for you to work with me. So it's all trying to anchor in what is our purpose. Now, putting your putting yourself in our person's shoes and thinking for a minute, how how can I make their life easier by maybe me doing something that can actually assist them? And your team has been really great on doing that. I want to make sure that we can talk about what's on everybody's mind more and more lately, which is content management. What's all this generative AI? You know, everybody can be negative effective and things like that. I think it's a great um, tool to use to go ahead as long as it's used smartly. What's happening on the the marketing, the CMO world, on looking at all these new technologies leading into 2025, 2030? Yes. Yeah, so there's a blend of excitement and trepidation. The excitement comes from exactly what you've identified, the capacity or potential of these tools to reduce the mundane tasks and to free up all our energy to doing higher order creative work. So that's the hope. A couple of fears I would highlight. One is in a creative field like ours, you need to be very mindful around intellectual property and using others' work and accreditation and attribution. I'm very thoughtful about that. And the creative community is certainly very thoughtful about artists' work and others. So that's a a bullet to be thoughtful about. Second one is back to our notion around inclusion. So much, at least if you use, for example, ChatGPT as one dimension that's getting a lot of press around artificial intelligence and, and all of that, It's trained on old data, maybe up as far as a couple of years ago. And much of that incorporates a lot of bias, human bias. So there's a risk that, for example, a study Bloomberg came out with, which asked the um, one of the tools it used, I think it used Stable Diffusion, to come up with an image of doctors, a job role. And the vast majority of the people it returned for that image were male disproportionate to the number of professionals who practice in that field. The same with many other queries that it launched around job descriptions. So my point is that's an illustrative example of the need to be aware of bias. And anywhere where there's human bias, technology can just compound that. But of course, that's particular to these large uh, language models right now. There's a lot of excitement around tools that will help us do our jobs. And they are you know, less making the public press would have potential to make us all more productive. So I'm very excited about that in the marketing area. What do you see around, I know a lot of brands right now, maybe they have not, I'll call it a brand refresh in my mind, where maybe their brand is still reading 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and it does not resonate necessarily with the younger generation that is going to be in the pool that's going to be spending more money. What do you see along those lines in your world? I see an opportunity for brands to take stock. I mean, everyone should be actively managing their brands. And that means collecting data on how a brand is resonating with stakeholders. So your assertion is an interesting hypothesis. So I would say to the brand, let's collect some data to test that hypothesis. Often, Heritage is a really good ingredient to play with, and it can resonate 
it may be in need of updating how it expresses it visually, verbally, et cetera. But to have a sustained business can be compelling for sure. It's just something the great brands actively must manage and engaging firms like ourselves first to do the diligence and see to what extent it's resonating. And then secondly, to look at the visual, experiential and verbal expression of the brand and see if it's in keeping with culture right now. I want to touch on one other point with you. We talk a little um, DEI. I want to make sure that we talk about leadership inclusion. So one thing I say in my field, my people apply. And I also tell our HR, if there's a woman who applies, I definitely want to see the resume because they're probably underselling themselves. But what do you, you see in the world? Because you do so much mentoring and stuff like that around with women and inclusion. Obviously, you do a variety of people along those lines. But what do you see and how do you mentor people on trying to get through that? There's a lot there, Rebecca. I mean, I can speak to two aspects of it. One is what we do at Seedland Gale. So for us, DEI is really important, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I think about it in terms of a slightly different sequence, because I think the inclusion part is the most important place to start. You can have diversity manifest in representation meaning you can count heads and see how many people from different populations are employed at an organization. But that is a very poor measure of inclusion. So for us, we do quite a number of focus groups. We collect baseline data and segment it by different populations to see the extent to which people are being included. And that's just as important a metric, the degree of inclusion by population, than um, how many people in a particular demographic are represented. So that's the first important thing. The second thing is inclusion is not just a hiring phenomena. It's how do you make sure people are successful when doing their jobs? We have quite a number of colleagues involved and enrolled in employee resource groups or ERGs to find support for, among each other and to be able to provide feedback back to leadership on how we can create an inclusive environment. So, so that's important. And a lot of it is it's about what you're measuring and the degree of sophistication by which you're measuring. Metrics I think are particularly useful are the rate at which people in different groups or different populations are being promoted. So that's a useful indicator. A lot of people stop at how many we have. No, are they getting into leadership positions? Um, compensation. You often correlate it with um, promotion, but we look at that at Siegel and Gale to make sure we have equity among our, our populations. And you have to start somewhere. So getting a baseline and spending a bit of money and getting an external party to come in and do that baseline work, I think is really important and constantly monitoring it. That's why I mentioned inclusion is one of our values. So what does that mean? Very practically, in my review, I measured on that. And I assess my colleagues on that. We ask ourselves day to day in our work, are we being inclusive? And that notion of having it be top of mind are some of the aspects that we found to be effective. But it comes with a lot of humility because we have a lot of work still to do. You know, one thing I would add is, you know, a lot of times when people leave an organization, they always have HR do the exit interview. And I always question that goes anywhere. Sometimes partnering with an outside firm they can really find out why people are really leaving the organization helps you with that inclusion point. You know, with that, our time is running short. How do people reach out and more about company, your services, and how can they go ahead and reach out to you for keynote engagements and things along those lines? Thank you, Rebecca. So I invite everyone to check out SiegelandGale.com, our website, my contact information, my colleagues' contact information is there, as well as lots of blogs and deep, deep content on the subjects you and I touched on. You can also follow us, of course, on LinkedIn and follow me, Margaret Malloy, on LinkedIn. Love seeing engagement with our content. Welcome the outreach and really deeply appreciative, Rebecca, of the opportunity to meet with your esteemed audience. Oh, Margaret, you are a soulful CXO. Thank you, Rebecca.